Well, thanks everyone for joining us for this uh, webinar, Visualization and Graphics and Jump. Uh, this is a really fun webinar to give, uh, especially because as many of you probably know, if you're Jump users, um, Jump is a wonderful environment to visualize and graph data, uh, both for the purposes of exploratory visualization, so when you're really first getting to know your data, uh, and also as an explanatory tool, so when you need to communicate findings in your data uh, to others. And so what we're going to cover today is extensively uh, Graph Builder, uh, really the main graphing platform within Jump. And if you've never seen Jump before, I'm just going to pull up in a sample data set, Hollywood Movies, uh, just to make sure everyone on the webinar, even if you've never seen Jump before, can follow along. Uh, Jump is statistical software. Uh, it works a little bit differently than most other statistical software, but it's very friendly, intuitive, and quick to learn. And one of the main things to know about Jump is that Jump wants to know uh, what the measurements you have in your data set actually mean. So for instance, in this Hollywood Movies data set, uh, I have something like Rotten Tomatoes scores. So these are numeric uh, values. And something like Lead Studio Name, these are categories. And you'll notice in Jump, uh, there's a section here for the columns list, and these actually have a different icon. And if I click on the icons, you can see this will reveal the modeling types available for a column. So the column of categories can only be marked as nominal or ordinal, or even none if I don't want to model it at all. What that says to Jump is that the values in this column are measured on a nominal scale. They're categories, and we should treat them as categories. Something like Rotten Tomatoes score has that blue triangle, and that's a continuous modeling type, which says to Jump that the values in that column should be treated as numbers. Now the reason I'm telling you this, if you've never seen Jump before, is that these distinctions actually matter to Jump when you produce analyses. For instance, if I produce a distribution output, I'll just grab both of those two columns I was talking about, the output I get in Jump is dependent on what categories or what uh, types of modeling types I've specified for the columns I entered. So for instance, lead studio name gets me frequencies and frequency distribution plot, whereas the continuous marked column, Ron Tomatoes scores, gets me a histogram and actual summary statistics and quantiles. So Jump will contextualize output based on the type of data you put in. Now beyond that, there's not too much you need to know about Jump for today's webinar if you've never seen Jump before. And what we're going to do is play around with a platform called Graph Builder, which is really the main place in Jump to produce composed graphics. Now, if you've never seen Jump before, you may have noticed that even when I went to an analysis platform, Jump gave me a graphical output. And this is something you'll see across Jump. Really, no matter where you go in Jump, there's always a visual to accompany a statistic that you get. But what we're going to focus on mostly today is Graph Builder, the main place in Jump to produce these graphics. And what I'm going to start with is really some Graph Builder basics. So if you've never used Graph Builder before, I want to get you up to speed with how it works and make sure you leave today's webinar knowing how to produce the most common types of graphics that you'll be producing. Now I'm using a Jump Journal on the left and I'll send you this Jump Journal as well as the recording to today's webinar after the webinar is over. So you can sit back and just watch if you don't uh, have Jump open, you don't need to do this as I'm doing it. Um, the data links to the data files I'm using here, these actually go to sample data. And so when you use the journal, you can just click these links like I will, or you can go to the help menu and go to the sample data directory. So all the data I'm using today is available with Jump when it ships. All right, so let's get started here. So Graph Builder is available under the Graph menu, and it's the first option there, Graph Builder. Now Graph Builder is really a drag and drop graphing environment. And what that means is that we simply have a list of our columns on the left, and we're going to move those columns. We'll just drag them over to the roles that create the type of graphic we want to make. Now Graph Builder has some other things. It has a ribbon along the top. I'll talk about these are the different graphing elements we can put into the graph. It has a graph control panel on the left-hand side. This is a place where you control certain characteristics of the element. And then there's red triangles that do additional things. So the red triangle for the graph builder and uh, overall menu, uh, this has specifications like legend position and settings, uh, setting color themes and doing other things. If you're new to jump, click every red triangle you see. They always have additional options that let you do different things. All right, first let's start with drop zones. So the drop zones are really broken apart into drop zones for data, that is the X and the Y, and then drop zones that in some way split up the plot that you get. So group for X, group for Y, the wrapping, an overlay role, and then a color and sizing role that really embellish the graph and the points uh, with additional information. And so let's try out just a simple graphic here. So remember, these are Hollywood movies uh, data, and so I have information on the Rotten Tomatoes score for each movie and the audience score. So maybe I'm interested in how these relate to each other. You know, they may not be exactly the same. An audience may review a movie differently than Rotten Tomatoes. So to employ these into different roles, I'm simply going to drag Rotten Tomatoes to the X, 
Notice as I hover over a roll, Jump will actually plot what the data will look like or what the graph will look like before I even drop it there. So I'm just going to drop that. And then I'm going to take audience score and I'm going to drag that to the Y. And notice that Jump will now produce my graph with the scatter plot. Now you notice Jump also added something to the graph, an additional element. This is the default when we have two continuous variables. This is called a smoother. So this is sort of like a moving average or a smooth line. And I have a control on the left in that control panel that lets me change the stiffness. So to the far right with lambda is a straight line. This is the linear regression of y into x. And going to the left, it allows a little more flexibility. So looking for local changes in the line. So I'll just leave that where it is. So notice that I used two roles here, the X and the Y data roles. Now we have additional roles that we can use within this graphic. And so let's look at a couple of these, the group X for Y and the wrapping roles. Now what these roles do is break up whatever visualization I've created in the center into the levels of whatever variable I put into each of those roles. So for instance, I have something called theme in my data set. Let me actually go back to the data set and show you. Uh, theme here is categorical. It's what type of theme is actually the movie. And I also have genre, something else categorical, what genre the movie is. So let's try to employ these in this graph. And I'm just going to drag this graph bigger because we're going to have a lot of levels of genre. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to drag genre over a couple roles. I'm not going to drop it. I'm actually just going to move it between them to show you what these different roles do. So let me hover it over group for X. And notice what happens immediately is that the X axis is split up across the different levels of genre. Now, when we have this many levels, uh, this graph doesn't really speak to me very much. Of course, graphics are, are made for us to communicate something valuable about the data. And when we have the axis so uh, truncated there, it's sort of a little bit hard to see what's happening. Similarly, if I go to group for Y, uh, we've made the Y axis split up so narrowly that we don't really get a sense of, of the meaning within the scatter plot. And so for lots of levels, the role I like is actually the wrapping role. And so this creates a trellis plot. And so what we have is for each of the different genres, the graph of Rotten Tomato score against audience score, but separated out for the different genres. And so this is a nice type of graphic if you're trying to show, especially with many levels of that categorical variable, that variable you're wrapping on the basis of, and you actually want to keep the, uh, the square graphs. So that's a nice way to do it. Now I'm going to click undo because I want to show you what happens if we use a different role. So we use the group X, Y, and wrapping. What happens if we use overlay? And so overlay is this role right here. And overlay works a little bit differently than the group X wrapping in Y. Because what overlay seeks to do is plot the same visual that I have in the center, but for the different levels of now genre. So let me drag that into overlay. And notice what happens is whatever elements I had already specified, and so I had specified a smoother and the points, all of those points and smoother elements are now duplicated across the different levels of genre. And this sometimes works very effectively. So in the case of a scatter plot, we're looking at really how coherent the relationship is between Rotten Tomato score and audience score for the different genres. And we do have a number of levels, but we can see there's a general coherence here. Uh, regardless of the genre, the relationship between those variables seems pretty consistent. And again, taking advantage of Jumps Interactivity here is very helpful. When I click on the different labels for the different genres, I can actually pull out those individual traces. And so we can actually pull them out and see which ones we're, we're dealing with. And this type of interactivity actually will extend to when I export this graph uh, to Interactive HTML, something I'm going to talk about later, when you actually want to create a dynamic visual that you want to put on a website. So that's what happens when we use the overlay role. Now, I'm going to take this out, and let's consider two additional roles. So, not overlaying or grouping, but when we want to embellish points by either changing their colors or changing their sizes. And so that's the color and size role. And these really refer to most commonly when you're working with points, although you can also color bars, and sometimes you can size special elements like shapes within a map. So let's try color here. And I'm actually going to take uh, genre again, and let's put that as the color. And I want you to see something about this that uh, I think makes a good point for how and when color should really be used. Uh, notice that we can use color as the different uh, colors here for, for action all the way through Thriller. Um, but there's not a very, I don't know, it's not a very big pop out for me. I, I can definitely identify which the points are by clicking on them. Uh, but with so many levels of genre, uh, the meaning sort of gets lost there for me. So I like to use coloring, uh, especially when I have categorical distinction, things where uh, I really want to make a point of one group versus another group. So that's not my favorite for that.
Now sizing is a different idea. So sizing will actually change the size of the points based on the levels of a variable. Uh, so for instance, let's take something like the world gross. This is a continuous variable. And I'm going to take this over to size. And what this will do is size the points on the basis of uh, world gross here. And what I like about this type of visual, especially when we're using a, a continuous variable here for the sizing, uh, is we can look at three dimensions of data now all at once, the, the relationship between the scores and, and really how that relates to world gross. And, and what you may notice is, well, most of the points, most of the, the high grossing movies are, are actually here at the top of the scale. That is, they're, they're the ones with the largest uh, size points. But there are a few notable exceptions, places where we had a low audience or low Rotten Tomato score, and yet they still grossed a lot in the world. So if I hover over those, Transformers was one of them. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides was another. Here's one way down here. So the Smurfs, who poorly rated, but actually made a lot of money. And so what I like about this is, uh, especially because it relies on some very strong pre-attentive processing, we can see pop-out effects very good because we're very good visually uh, as a species. We can actually pull out these, these elements that uh, don't fit in with an otherwise coherent sort of pattern in the data. Uh, and so this is a nice uh, way to incorporate those additional variables. Now I want to make a point here. We can use for sizing, uh, we can use a categorical variable. I just want you to see what will happen here. Jump will do its best to figure out what you mean. What it's actually doing is alphabetizing the genres. And so the bigger points are actually the ones that have uh, a genre, see genre 8 here. It's actually numbered them based on uh, alphabetical score. That seems crazy, but what if you had an A through G scale for something that actually was continuous, uh, but you had given them letters? Well, Jump wants to let you use that, so it will let you use for sizing uh, something that is categorical. Similarly, for color, Jump will let you use something continuous. So let me put in for world gross the color. And notice rather than giving discrete colors, what Jump is going to do is give you this gradient. That is, the, the higher world grossing films will get a hotter color based on this color scheme. Now we're going to come back to talking about color themes and actual gradients later. I just want to show you, if you right click and select gradient here, there's lots of customizations you can apply. And, and again, if you never used Jump before, uh, since Jump is very modern statistical software, you can right click everything. And so there's always additional options. Um, let me tell you my favorite thing to do when I have something like World Gross, which is on a big scale. Um, my favorite is actually to change the scale type to something like Quantile. So it's going to scale them within the, the quantiles here. And actually something that I find very useful is I like giving them discrete colors. And I'm actually going to say give me only three label points. So I want to do a low versus high. So a 0, 50%, 100%. And so I can actually look at the top 50% versus the lower 50%. And so again, my point with color, uh, we're not very good with five or more colors as far as pre-attentively processing where they are. Two is amazing. We can pick out patterns between two patterns or two colors uh, very, very quickly and without much effort. So whenever possible, if that makes sense for your data, it's a very nice thing to do. And so we'll come back to actually working with, with the gradient tools a little bit later. All right, so that was... Uh, Actually, I'm going to click done here and hold this graph. Those were the, the main drop zones. Uh, but there's a special drop zone I'm going to have to employ a different data set for just to show you. And that's the map shape drop zone. And this is something that relies on in Jump if you have data that actually have states or counties or geographic regions, something that identifies a region so that you can plot data as a heat map on those regions. And let me show you what I mean. So these are US demographics that we have in the sample data. I'll go back to Graph Builder and get myself a new palette here. And all I have to do is use this map shape section. And so what I'm going to do is drag state into the map shape section. And I get a little canvas here of the United States. Now what Jump is asking me for is now a quantitative variable or a categorical variable to color the states by. And so let's pick something like how many smokers there are in an individual state. And so I'm going to hover over the center, and, and what you may notice is that when I drop it in the center, Jump's going to make a guess about where that, that variable should go. And what it's done is ported it over into the color role for me. And so just like I did before, I'm actually going to get a little uh, gradient here that's grading the states or showing the colors for the states on, on that variable. And so the map shape role is actually quite nice. We can produce maps of a number of different styles here. And so I'm going to come back to showing geographic mapping a little bit later. It's not the only way we can make maps. We can actually also use latitudes and longitudes if we have them available in our data site. So mapping is also something that Jump does uh, very easily and very quickly. Now there are two roles, or a few roles actually, that I, I've 
going to skip over here the frequency and the paging role. And so you'll notice them down here, the frequency and page. Um, we don't really need to talk about those today. Frequency is there for pre-summarized data. So when you want to bring back to the original data, if you have frequency counts or weighting variables. And paging, sort of like the group X, group Y, and wrapping, is a way of showing the same plot uh, across different sections, but it actually produces them across different pages. And so we're not going to employ that much today. Uh, but just so you can see what it is, I'll, I'll make a quick graph here, and I'll take something like region, and I'm going to drop it into the page section. And notice what page will do is instead of showing them in the same plot, I actually get multiple plots all for the different regions. So this might be very useful for you, especially when you want to make plots uh, of the exact same type, uh, but for maybe across different regions of your, your company or for across different uh, classrooms or whatever it is that you're trying to graph. And so not the same graph, but across different graphs. And so sometimes very useful. So we won't talk about those too much today. But that's the basic idea of Graph Builder. It's to very quickly allow you to create your graphic uh, simply by dragging and dropping columns across. We made a number of graphs quickly just to show the drop zones, but what we're going to do in a second is step through a little more concretely uh, how to use all these different elements, how to combine them in certain ways, and how to make the type of visual you're looking to make. But before I go any further, I want to say something really important here, and which is how to show and hide the control panel uh, that I have on the left. Because if you're going to be showing these data to somebody, uh, you don't want to show them the control panel with your columns, with your points, with all the roles you haven't used. You actually want to complete the graphic to make it in more of a publication quality form. I've actually been to conferences where I see people with their jump graphics showing the group X and the wrap roles, you know, showing the extra roles there. And so don't be that person. Click the done button to hide the control panel, to hide everything else, and get your more or less finalized graph. You can still make customizations here. For instance, maybe you want to move the uh, the legend to be inside the graph. So I can go to the red triangle and put that inside the graph or something like that. You can still make some changes, but we've more or less finished uh, defining the roles in the data set and more or less finished controlling what those elements are doing. And so that's what hiding the control panel does. To get it back, Go to the red triangle and click on the control panel again. And so notice you're not, you know, finished with it. You can always come back to the control panel. Uh, but before you save a file out, click that done button because that's going to actually close all the additional elements and get you that more or less finalized graphic. Okay. So just a point about showing and hiding controls. So let's talk about some graph types here. And so we've uh, we've looked at how to use the drop zones, but let's talk about the different elements that are available within different graphics. And so this little diagram here, this is actually the ribbon that's at the top of my, my data set here. And so these different elements are things we can employ in different situations depending, again, on the type of data that we're putting into Jump. And I say that pointedly because Jump is going to give you uh, the best options based on the modeling types that are available. And so when you bring in data, just make sure those modeling types are set correctly. Again, if you're brand new to Jump, it's as simple, simple as clicking on the icon in the columns list and setting the modeling type. For the most part, Jump will get it right as soon as you import data. If there are numbers, it'll say it's continuous. If there are characters, it says it's nominal. Uh, but occasionally, I see data such as gender that's categorized as one, two, and three. So one and two for male, or three for did not respond. Well, those aren't really numbers. Jump will think they are unless you tell it differently. And so it's good to make sure to go in and set those to be nominal. So be aware that Jump is going to pay attention when it produces uh, these graphics. Now, you may have noticed when I drag variables in, Jump will often pre-assign a particular element. And so when I have two continuous variables, the pre-assigned elements are the points and the actual little smoother line here. To change an element, I'm just going to click on some just to show you what happens. I'll click on the line of fit. And notice that Jump will change out the smoother, but keep the points. That's actually what, in this little visual, notice the points are still on. So Jump is telling you when I switch to that, the points stay there. If I click to the ellipse, Jump says, OK, well, you still want the points, but we're going to show the density ellipse. But notice that for the rest of these, there's no points shown. So when I click on uh, the heat map here, the contour, it doesn't actually continue to show the points. And we have control options, of course. I can say, give me more levels for the contour. That cleans things up for me a little bit. Uh, but let's say I wanted to get the points back. And so uh, we're going to talk here about adding and removing. You've already seen how to add. How about if we wanted to layer an element? So I want not just the contour, but also the points to be on here. And so the way to do that is, and there's two ways, either drag the points on top, and notice what that does is it appends the points to the graphic, or hold down the shift key and click on the points. 
and in jumps mind that says, hey, you don't want to remove whatever element you just added. Uh, you actually just want to add this new element on top of it. And you can do this multiple times. I'm going to hold down the shift key again and click on the contour. And let me just drag in a smoother as well to show you the other options. So we can add many elements uh, and we're actually able to control these elements in specific ways to make more complicated visuals. And so these are things that we can employ uh, one at a time or multiple at a time if that's what we want. Now, I'll just make a point as I go further, uh, Jump will always let you plot things that maybe even don't make any sense. And so I can click on little box plots here and notice Jump doesn't even know what to do with it. We have two continuous variables. Uh, I can turn on uh, little bars, and so Jump will draw bars instead of uh, points for each of the data points it has. And there's some that just don't make any sense at all. If I click on a pie chart, you know, what is Jump trying to do with that? Well, it's the frequency of observations uh, for one of these variables. And so be aware, Jump will let you do things that maybe don't make sense. Uh, so it's incumbent on you a little bit to think about what you're trying to plot here to make sensible graphs. All right, so those are the element controls. Let's talk about some basic examples of plotting data. And continuous by continuous is really the first thing that we were talking about, the one that um, really a lot of graphs start with, making the scatter plot there. And again, the scatter plots are as easy as dragging two variables in that are continuous and jump will add them to your axes. Uh, you saw before the way I was doing it was dragging one to one axis and one to the other. Uh, it's nice that you can simply drag both in at once and jump will just assign them to the two axes. And so that's the basic scatter plot. And scatter plots, as you saw, we can embellish with multiple types of elements. If we want the line of fit, what that'll give us is the regression of y onto x. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about controls later on, but you'll notice on the left-hand side, uh, we have controls for what we want to show. So this is showing the working hotel and confidence band. Uh, maybe we don't want the confidence band for the fit. We actually just want the line itself. Uh, or we want a different type of confidence band, a confidence band for predictions, so showing us where we predict new observations should be uh, within some proportion of the time. So 95% is the standard here. Uh, we can also add on certain statistics. Um, Graph Builder is not really an analysis platform, but maybe you still want to show the root mean squared error uh, or your R squared or the, even the equation of the line uh, when you're graphing uh, a line of fit. And so we can add in certain elements here that make sense. Now, there are some other visuals that really do make sense when you have uh, lots of data points. And so I want to show you one example um, that I find useful. And actually, the last time I gave this webinar, somebody asked a really important question. What do I do when I have so much data that it's hard to see where the points are? That is, they're just a cloud covering themselves. And so I'm going to pull up in some semiconductor data here. And so we have um, many processes we measured. There's only 1,400. The problem I'm going to show you gets even worse when you have you know millions or billions of observations. Uh, but let me go to Graph Builder. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to drag in um, sort of uh, two of these, these variables, and it's not terribly important what they are right now. Uh, we're looking at really wafer problems. But uh, notice the smoother comes on first. I'm going to turn that off. Um, we get a sense that there's a big cloud in the center, that is most of the data points are really uh, clustering around the center, and we, we see fewer out into the extremes. Uh, but it's not entirely clear how different the density is right here where my mouse is versus the dead, the dead center. And so one graph that I like and something you may find value in is this heat map. And so heat maps are, are very useful for categorical by categorical variable. We're going to see a number of them in a minute. But let me show you what happens when I do it for continuous by continuous data. What Jump's going to do is now show me the count based on the locations in X and Y. And so what we're seeing is the hottest density, right, is the dead center. And we see how um, the values sort of fall out or the counts go down as we move further away from the center. Now let me show you something I really like. I'm going to double click the axis and we'll talk about axis customizations as well later on. Uh, but we can change the increment here. That is, we don't need the increment to be just 50. I'm going to put uh, 10 minor increments. And what that means is that for the, the widths of those little uh, heats that is uh, showing the points here, uh, we can actually show a little bit more granularity. And so minor ticks, I'm going to say, let's say 5 for this axis. And so maybe, uh, especially when we have lots and lots and lots of data, we need this sort of granular heat map to show us really the differences in densities. And so we can see some hotspots here that we never would have been able to see before. And so there's one actually right here, uh, and maybe a few that are far apart from center. Certainly the dead center is most, uh, but we're able to pick up on some, some extra information here that is otherwise hidden uh, when we're just looking at the points. That doesn't really give us the sense. And so explore that heat map, especially when you have very large amounts of data and you're trying to show them um, in this sort of way. 
All right, so let's move on from scatter plots though, because I want to show you some categorical by continuous and continuous by categorical. Turns out these are really the same in Jump's mind. Uh, one continuous and one categorical variable uh, really means the same. And a categorical by categorical sort of plot. So when we have two things that are really just categories. So let's start by continuous by categorical. And to do this, let me go back to my, my Hollywood movies data set. And I'm going to go to graph, graph builder, pull up a new canvas for myself here. And let's look at just one continuous variable. Let's say the Rotten Tomatoes score. I'm going to drag that to the y-axis. And let's say I'm interested in how the Rotten Tomatoes scores uh, change or are different across the different genres. And so let me take genre and drag it to the x-axis. Now before I click anything, let's look at what Jump did. It's still showing me points. And I actually quite like this view. It's showing me the points within each of the genres. And we can see for, for some of the genres, we only have one or maybe even two points. Um, for our purposes, I'm actually going to grab these. I'm going to hold down the shift key. Uh, let's actually right click. And I'm going to go to, uh, let's see, rows here. And I'm going to do row, hide, and exclude. So actually, let's take those out of the graph for now. So I want some, some really rows with uh, lots of data or columns with lots of data. So. If we're looking across here, we're looking just at the different genres and the points within them. And this gives a great sense of the distribution of the variables. And I, the reason I like this view is because when we switch to something like a bar chart, which is what we're going to talk most about, notice that hides, in a sense, the, the variability within a category. And we can always turn on things like error bars. And so error bars, standard error and the range and standard deviation. I'll turn on standard error here. You know, that gives a sense of the variability within a particular category. Uh, but the points is something I really like. I think that really shows uh, the data. So I encourage you to use a view like this when you can uh, to really show the observations. You're not showing the center, of course. So if showing the mean is what's valuable. Uh, certainly use something like a bar. Um, but if you need to show the variability within a particular category, this is a great view. But let's switch to bars because let's talk about the bar and column chart options here. Let me turn off my, my standard error bars. Now, what I'm showing here is what we would traditionally call a column chart. And so column charts have the categories on the x-axis and the continuous variable on the y. Now, if we wanted to switch the roles, that is genre now to be on the uh, y-axis and Ron tomato score on the x, I want to show you a really neat trick and jump, something that's going to be incredibly valuable for you, I think, when you're trying out different visuals. And simply right click on a variable, you'll see there's a swap section. And what we can do is we can swap that variable with another variable we're currently using. And so I'll say swap with genre. And what Jump is going to do now is show us the genres along the y axis and the Rotten Tomato score along the x. And one thing I'll say about this is this becomes a very useful way of plotting data, especially when you have lots of different genres. And so when you have, uh, let's say, 50 rather than the number we have here, uh, you'll actually get a lot more value showing them in this way because simply we don't have to rotate the tick labels. It's a lot easier to show variables with lots of levels uh, when those levels are occurring on the y-axis. And so that's a really handy thing to do. Now, another way we can show these data, instead of just using the mean or whatever summary statistic we want to specify on the left, instead of just showing them as bars, another view I quite like are the box plots. And because box plots, uh, just like showing the raw points, are giving a sense of the distribution of the data. Uh, now, of course, box plots are not showing the same thing as the bars. The center of the box plot in each of these is the median, not the mean. And we're looking at the 25th and 75th quartiles, and then the outer fences. And so these are showing a sense of the distribution of the data, but also some sense of the middles or the median in this case. So that's a very nice view, especially when you want to convey, you know, not just center, but also a little bit about the spread within the data. And so those are our very nice views. Now I want to show you another one that you may not have seen before, and these are called violin and contour plots. And to show you these, I'm going to switch over to another data set, the one that I always like to show with this, which is Fisher's iris data. So these are measurements uh, of different species of irises on different sort of measurements within the flower, the, the sepals and the petals. And so let's go back to Graph Builder. And I'm going to put species here on my x-axis. So we just look at the different species. And let's put something like sepal length in as my, my y. Now we already saw we can do a bar chart to show the, the mean. We can do the box plots to show the median plus a little bit of information about the, the distribution of the variables. But let's try this one, the contour. You saw me turn this on for a scatter plot before, but I want you to see what it does when you turn it on for uh, a categorical predicting something continuous. Now what this is showing is sort of just like the points and just like the box plots, something about the distribution of the data. 
Uh, just to show you that, let's let's drag on the points and notice what it's doing is the place where there's the most points, it's having the fattest part of the contour, the place where there's the least points has the thinnest part. And so what you get is really a folded distribution. You're looking at the distribution uh, like you would if you were looking at little histograms almost. So you're looking at those, but in a contour. And what's great about this type of plot is it's, it's a nice, very low uh, work or low effort type of plot to see where, where the values are, especially when you have lots and lots of data uh, where you wouldn't want to show just a cloud of points. Uh, the contours show you something that, that's very useful. And we'll come back to, to layering visuals with the contour uh, to make some specialized graphics with it. That's why I like those. We also call these violin plots. All right, so that's continuous by categorical. Uh, what about when we have categorical by categorical data? So something we haven't really looked at yet. So to do this, I'm going to pull open a different data set. Let me minimize these ones. I'm going to pull open my uh, consumer preferences data set. And I'm also going to pull open a different one we haven't seen yet either, uh, San Francisco crime. And so let me start with um, heat maps. And so heat maps, uh, which we made for the continuous by continuous data before, uh, are really useful when we're looking at categorical against categorical. And so for this data set, uh, these are 9,000 or so incidents of, of crime in San Francisco. And suppose that my question was, uh, how do the, the crimes really distribute themselves across different days of week and, and also across the different police districts? And so we have different districts in our, in our data set. So how, you know, how often are there crimes in each district, but also across the different days of week? So let's go to Graph Builder and let's see how we're going to do this. So day of week, let's pick an axis. I'm going to put it on my Y axis here. Notice what Jump does first is it just shows us the count or the number of observations. So that gives us some information. Monday has the highest amount of crime, apparently, or at least crime reported. Uh, let's put police district on the X axis. So I'm going to drag it here. Now, Jump's going to do something kind of funny. It has to choose which variable you're trying to show. It doesn't know how to do that. And so it's saying, okay, well, I guess I'm going to show the frequency across the different districts. But as soon as you click on something like a heat map, the data become clear. And now what it's showing us, and let's take a second to look at this, uh, we have, again, representing the count or the, the observations, right? So where do we get observations? But now broken up into these cells, so the different days a week and the different police districts. And so we're, we're can obviously see the southern region has the most uh, frequency of crime reported, uh, and something like Park has the least, right, the bluest. But we can also see hot spots across uh, different days. You know, there's some days on Friday uh, that the mission has a lot of crime, and Mondays and even Sundays the mission has a lot of crime. And so with the heat map, and this is a great way of showing this, uh, we're able to really look at uh, both dimensions and get a quick pop-out effect for where there are our incidents. Now, like any kind of uh, graph we have, we can also layer by different categorical variables or continuous variables. So if we wanted to employ some of these different roles, we could. So for instance, what if we want to break this up by whether it was a traffic incident or not? So let me put that in my group for X. And you can see the vast majority of these are not traffic incidences. So there are some traffic incidences, but uh, for the most part, even no reported data here, uh, they're not. All right, so that's one way of doing this. So let me click Done. And I want to show you something else you could do with heat maps. So I'm going to go back to Graph Builder. This time, let's try something different. I'm going to do, um, let's do time of day on the x-axis. And so that's the, the median time things are reported by day of week. So now I still get box plots. Now remember, we can use uh, heat maps when we actually have continuous variables. You saw me do that for the wafers. And so when I click on a heat map now, Look what Jump does is it actually is breaking off the time into different sections. It shows three hour bins. Remember, we can always change that. I'll double click on the axis and let's actually do uh, one minor tick to get it down to uh, one and a half hour bins. So we're looking at the time of day by day of week and now we get another type of graph, not just uh, which district and what um, really day of week we're on, uh, but actually what time of day these incidents are most uh, most prolific. And so it looks like, you know, certainly Mondays, there's some pop out effects here and Fridays. So Fridays from six to seven 30, uh, there's certainly a lot of them and the majority being in the, uh, the Southern district. And so I think this is a neat view and something to remember that you can use those heat map elements when you're actually working with a continuous variable, something I think is pretty neat. Okay, so let's look at a different type of categorical by categorical, some mosaic plots. And mosaic plots I really like. This is actually the default type of plot you get when you go to fit y by x and you employ two categorical variables. So let's go to Graph Builder. 
And uh, in the consumer preferences data, these are 400 or so observations from people uh, measured on a, on a number of things. So some basic things like birth years, whether they're single or not, uh, their age group and salary, um, and then some some utterly random things like how often do they floss, how often do they brush before dinner, uh, how much does their toothpaste cost, you know. So uh, I, I worry about the type of people who responded to this kind of random survey. So let's look at these data. Um, and let's ask a question of these data that involves two categorical variables. So perhaps we're wondering about um, age group as some kind of predictor here. So age group in the data set, let me drag it to the X and you'll see uh, these are grouped bins of different ages. So 25 to 29, 30 to 34, et cetera. And then we have a catch-all group, uh, the over 54 individuals. And so what if we're, we're wondering how do uh, some of these other variables relate to the age group? So for instance, let's say job satisfaction. So let me drag... Uh, job satisfaction to the Y, you'll see what Jump immediately does. It shows us the points again. And again, this shows sort of the, in a very quick way, uh, where do you have observations? So very few people are not at all satisfied between 35 and 39 in this data set. But let's use uh, sort of a more visual way of showing this. And this is the, the mosaic over here. And what I love about the mosaic is that it shows a lot of information about the data all at once. And so let me orient you first to, to what's happening on the x-axis, because if you look, the x-axis is not spaced equally for the different age groups. That is, the 25 to 29 section is wider. Now, the reason it's wider is we had more people in the data set who were 25 to 29, and we had the fewest people in the data set who were 45 to 49. And so the width of the columns here on the x-axis is showing that. So that's a representation of frequency there. But what's happening inside each column is really the magic of the mosaic plot. What it's showing for us is the conditional probabilities or the proportions within each group. So for instance, let's look just at the 25 to 29 year olds. So the not at all satisfieds are the lower section. And so if you read off the probability here, let me actually double click the axis and let's uh, set the increment to something smaller. I'll do every 5% here. And so if we look at, ooh, let me do actually 10%, that'll be good. There we go. So if we look at this, the 25 to 29 year olds, there's a small proportion, about 5% of them, 5.3 exactly if we hover, uh, who actually are saying they're not at all satisfied. And then there's a group in the center from that 5% all the way up to the 65. So that comes out to be about 60% that are somewhat satisfied. And then the top section are the extremely satisfied. And so what's neat is that you can see the proportion within each group, that is groups along the x-axis, that are answering in that way. And what you're basically seeing here, if, if I were to get this plot, is there's not much difference across the different ages in terms of their job satisfaction. They're relatively flat. Each of the shares within each of the sections are pretty equivalent. But let's actually take another variable just to give you a contrast. What would it look like if there was a big difference across age for whatever the Y variable we're specifying is? Well, what about people, whether they're working on their career or not? So people who are younger are majorly answering that they agree they're working on their career. Uh, but as we get to the older individuals, fewer of them are saying they're really working on their career. Although almost half are still saying that they're working on their career who are over 54. But notice that what's great about the mosaic plot, and this is true across all visualizations, if you can make a plot that as soon as somebody sees it, the meaning within the plot is obvious, uh, then you've made a good graph. If you make something that's very difficult to understand and is too embellished or too complicated, where you have to explain it for you know more than a couple minutes, um, there's almost certainly a better way to display whatever you're displaying, and you should work on that graphic. Uh, because graphs should be obvious as quick as possible. Uh, the point of a graph is to um, really convey information, not to impress people. So make the, the simplest graphics that conveys your story. All right, so that's a mosaic plot, a really neat type of visual, I think, and one that, I, um, especially when you have categorical by categorical data, uh, you should certainly be turning to. All right, so those are the basic examples. Uh, let's talk about employing additional variables within your within your graphics. And we've done a lot of this uh, just as we're playing around, but let's take a little a more formal uh, look into this. Now, the first one I want to talk about is overlay. And so overlay we saw when we had uh, continuous by continuous. That was something we did with the first data set. But let me show you overlay when we're actually working with bars or columns. And so I'll go back to consumer preferences. And so let's actually look at um, maybe the different age groups again. So that's a categorical variable. And let's look at their salaries. And so how much money are these people making in the different age groups? So I'm going to turn on the bars. 
And notice what jump did is it picked the summary statistic for us. And so that's true whenever you plot bars or something that has to summarize the data, uh, we have to choose a summary statistic. And so in this case, uh, it chose for us the mean. And so what if we use the overlay role? And what that's going to do for us, just like it did before, it breaks up whatever visual we have in the middle across the levels of something else. And so let's take a, a variable that would do that. What about uh, the people who are working on their career versus the people who aren't working on their career? So let's go to overlay. And notice what happens is Jump will break up the visual, that is break up the data and the bars to show those people who agreed with that statement and those who disagreed with that statement. And what we're generally seeing, just to interpret the graph quickly, is the people who are working on their careers, the agrees, um, they're typically making more money than the people who say they're not working on their career. Although we have one uh, sort of uh, counterexample to this, the 50 to 54 year olds, um, for whatever reason, the people who aren't working on their careers seem to be making more money. Uh, but that quickly changes for the 54 and over. So who knows what's happening there. But notice that we have additional options for how to control this. So the bar style on the left-hand side is important. What we're plotting right now is a side-by-side -side bar. Now, another way you'll often see multiple categories presented are stacked bars. And so stacked bar charts actually put the bars and sum them together. Now, this gets a little bit weird for these data. Um, this is now showing the total mean between those two different groups, which maybe doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but one thing I'll say about uh, stacked bar charts is just to caution you, our ability to resolve the interior elements uh, diminishes as the number of levels increases for overlay. And so what I mean by this is instead of using, um, let's say, a two categorical variable, uh, what if we take something like employee tenure? And so let me take that over here. So as soon as we have many levels of the interior components, it becomes really difficult uh, perceptually. I mean, we can do it, obviously, but it takes work on our part to resolve the interior components. For instance, if I ask you about the people who have more than 20 years of employee tenure, how their salaries are changing on average, you can tell there's one big group here, that is, they're making a lot more on average, uh, but it sort of gets difficult to resolve the differences here. Whereas if we had these as side by side, uh, it becomes really easy to see that trajectory uh, simply because you're going to compare across them. And so I'd just be weary of the, the stacked version. Uh, but let me undo a couple times to get back to the, the previous variable I had here. There we go. I'm working on my career. So that's what stacked does. Uh, I want to show you some of these other ones because some are actually really quite valuable. I remember side by side is the default. And so if we were to go to bullet, I want to show you what this does. This actually moves one of the categories inside the other category. And so this is actually nice. This, this will show, especially when you have uh, a control, it's actually nice to show it this way. The control is sort of in the background, and you're looking at how one differs from the other. Nested works the same way. Nested puts one inside the other. This works with more than a couple levels. And some of these aren't, aren't really appropriate for this case. So range will show the difference between uh, the agrees and disagrees. Same thing with interval shows the difference between the two. These are often used for stocks or things like that. Uh, single is kind of neat. Single shows the second category as a line above or below the, uh, the original bar. Uh, stocks, again, show sort of like a range. The box plot doesn't really make sense in this one. Uh, needles, very thin lines, so very thin points. Uh, and float don't show bars at all, really, but show the, the lines for each. And so these are often used when we're embellishing graphs with additional plots. And so I'll show you a couple of those in a minute. But let's go back to side by side because I want to make a point about this. So when you're doing side by side plots, um, make sure you're drawing the right comparison that you want to draw. For instance, the way we've plotted these data, we're making it very easy to compare how much people make when they agree and don't agree uh, with working on their careers. That is, because the bars are right next to each other for that, it's very simple to make that comparison perceptually. We get a pop out, really. We see that the blue bars are almost always above the red. But what if we were to switch these variables? And remember, we can right click a variable and go to swap. I want you to see that if we swap it with, swap it with age group, that distinction, that comparison becomes much more difficult. So if I asked you, well, what's the effect of, of age, or sorry, of working on their career versus not? We really make we can sort of say that the whole mass over here tends to be a little higher than this one. At least I can sort of see that, knowing what I already know about these data. Um, but that comparison is almost completely lost. Uh, we're very good at looking at the age trajectory within each of these. That is, people who are getting older or are older seem to be making more money. Uh, but the direct comparison between 
working on their career, yes or no, um, isn't really obvious. So try different visuals. You know, I'm going to swap them back and notice that that really does convey that story. And so with Graph Builder, it's very simple to change these around. So try different visuals is what I would say. And notice that we can drag these variables to different roles too. So we can always use them within the grouping or the group X, uh, but overlay really conveys that message, I think, most forcefully. Okay, I want to tell you about two additional roles you may not have known about, and that's the side-by-side -side role and then a multiple Y and multiple X role. And side-by-side -side is really neat. So if I bring back a graph builder, and let's again look at salary. You know, we were looking at age group as my X axis, and I'll put back on the bars. But what if we wanted to, not in the same plot, also look at the people who are working on their careers or not on the average? So not combining those two plots, but just showing another plot within the same plot. And so I want to show you something here. There's a drop zone just to the left and just to the right of my original x-axis. And notice what this is doing is this is plotting not in the same plot again, not breaking up the bars, but a separate plot showing salary differences for those variables or for the categories within that variable. And so this actually turns out to be rather useful when you want to make sort of a visual where you need to show the effect of maybe multiple variables separately on some outcome variable. Now this works also on the y-axis. Now we don't need to just show salary. Uh, what if we wanted to show the years that they were at their current position? So notice there's a drop zone above and a drop zone below salary. I'll do below this time. And now I get another y-axis. And so now I have this plot. I'll click done where I'm actually looking at a number of things all at once, all at one plot. Now be careful with this. You can make very complicated plots that tell no story uh, very quickly. And so maybe this is, is communicating something important in the data. Uh, but let's say we wrap this now by job satisfaction. You know, now we have something that's pretty complicated. So not at all satisfied, somewhat satisfied and extremely satisfied. Uh, looking at each of these against each other, um, there's just a lot happening here. And so my recommendation when you are uh, making visuals that are telling a complicated story is make separate visuals. Um, just like no one book is told as a single paragraph or single sentence, uh, no story of data uh, is ever really told with a single graph unless it's a very simple one. And so, you know, be careful making overly complicated graphics. Again, point of visualization is to convey meaning, uh, not to impress people that you can make uh, trellis plots. All right, so let me show you a different type of role that, again, you might not have known about, the multiple Ys and the multiple Xs. And so these are useful when you actually are plotting multiple things that are really on the same scale, um, but you want to show them on the same plot. So I'll go back to my Hollywood Movies data set. And imagine what I'm trying to show is those Rotten Tomatoes and audience scores uh, on the same axis again. So I'm going to go back to Graph, Graph Builder. And let's ask a slightly different question. Let's say, how does the world gross of a movie sort of predict uh, audience score and Rotten Tomato score? Well, I'll put one on the axis first. So world gross predicting Rotten Tomato score. What if I wanted to add audience score in there as well? So not above it, which of course I can do or below it, of course I can do that. I want to add that as a separate line. So there's a drop zone right on the inside, right here, that will actually add audience score as an additional plot. Notice then we have a line here uh, for each of them, and I have points for each of them. So jump is multi-plotting those in the same graphic. Uh, the same thing is true for the x-axis. So what if I want a production budget uh, in addition to world gross? And so I can add that in here as well. I'm not even going to drop it there because that gets overly complicated way too quickly. Uh, but notice there are times when you really do want to show um, two things in the same plot. This is a great instance. You know, what is the relationship and is it about the same for each of the different types of ratings? Now, I want to show you something that can happen that's a problem oftentimes when you're adding multiple things to the same plot like this, but you have something that's on a very different scale. And so what if I also wanted to add in, uh, let's say, domestic gross? And notice what happens. So I added domestic gross. That's on a hugely different scale because remember my, my ratings are 0 to 100. My domestic gross goes from 0 to 350 in terms of millions of dollars. And so I'm not really able to see what's happening for the, the Rotten Tomatoes scores or the audience scores uh, just because the scale is so different. We can't have a unified scale that conveys the same, the same thing very effectively. Now, there's something important I want to show you, but I caution you about using it. It's this double axis plotting. So what if I wanted a separate axis on the right-hand side for one of these variables, specifically for the uh, domestic gross? So we can right-click 
the list of variables here, the variables names, and notice there's a move to the right section. And so I'm gonna say move to the right domestic gross. And notice what I get now is I get two axes. And so I'll hit done just so we can clean this up and show it bigger. I get two axes, one for domestic gross on the right, which refers to the observations on that, that green line. And then I have an axis unified for the Rotten Tomatoes and the audience score. So Jump will do this for you. Again, this is one of these plots where it's more complicated, I think, than it needs to be. Uh, and it can often misconstrue things. And so if we're looking at world gross uh, and we're looking at, at domestic gross here on this axis, it just gets, we have to make sure not to pay attention to this scale with these variables. And, and it's just, it often gets to the point where you can just make separate graphs and, and probably convey things a little bit more clearly. Um, so no, you can do that though. It's just simply right clicking and you can move variables to the right and you can always move it to the, to the left again so we can move it back. All right. So that's multiple Y's and multiple X's and double plotting. And so rather quickly, I want to talk about some special elements. We, uh, have looked at the, we, we can do multiple graph elements at the same time. Um, I want to show you that with sort of my favorite example again with the Iris data set. So if I go back to graph builder, um, I showed you the option of making that contour plot. So again, that was putting species on the x-axis. I put petal length on the y. I clicked on the contours. And one thing I said was the contours showed the distribution really well. Uh, we're not getting a good measure of center. But one thing I want to show you, and this involves the layering of visuals. So if I drag on the points and I use something under the controls here, I say under the controls for the summary statistic, give me the mean and show me a standard error around that. Uh, this is a visual I kind of like. It's showing me uh, measures of the center, but also the distribution. And so if we, uh, let's drag in a variable where these are a little bit closer. And so I'll drag sepal length on top of that. Um, notice this gives me a sense of the spread of the data, but also that measure of center that I think we all always want to show. And so I think that's kind of a neat graphic. So remember, you can always layer multiple graph elements um, to use uh, those visuals effectively. Geographic mapping, I already showed you how to do that as a shape-based map. Um, I do want to mention that you can also graph latitude and longitude. So if we go back to San Francisco crime, I'll go to Graph Builder. If you have latitude and longitude in your data set, it's as simple as dragging those two variables in. And you actually get the points first, and that's smoother. A jump, as far as it's concerned, is, is concerned you're plotting points. Uh, it knows how to treat latitude and longitude, so it's actually plotting them with degrees. But to get the map, right-click the graph, go to the graph submenu and go to background map. And what this will do is show you sort of the background map options. You can do the, the regular things like simple earth, detailed earth, these are images. Um, but the one I wanna show you is street map service. What this does is phones out on the internet and pulls down the open street maps data. And so now we actually have the, uh, the background map of San Francisco. And then we go to the tools menu, I'll go to the magnifier and just show you we can zoom in. And so we get down to our street level detail uh, really easily here. And so it's worth playing with this if you have uh, geographic maps. And so if anyone uses Qualtrics, uh, Qualtrics will grab the, uh, the latitude and longitude from the survey location. And so as best it can. And so this is a great thing to use uh, to look at where respondents are coming from. All right, so let me skip over some of these. Uh, we're running a little bit short on time and I wanna mention um, under graph controls, I showed you how to change statistics. So you saw me do this with the points. I can make the points show the mean or I can have a bar show the median. Uh, limiting variables this is something I want to show you actually as part of a tip I'm going to give you. Um, there are sometimes when we want to make custom error bars, and uh, this comes up a lot with scientific data. And so if I pull open a data table here, this actually is looking at the salaries uh, by the different age levels again. Imagine we wanted to make a custom error bar um, based on something that was not just the standard error, so not just sigma over root n. And so it's not entirely clear uh, until you do it a couple times how you're going to make this custom error bar in Graph Builder. And so let me show you a really neat trick that involves uh, a number of things we've learned all at once. Uh, changing statistics, uh, creating new variables, something I'm going to show you right now, and also using some special elements and layering elements in Graph Builder. And so what we're going to do is go to the data table and we're going to manually make the upper and lower limits for the error. So if I grab these two variables, you may not have known this, but you can right click them in the table go to new formula column, combine, and we can do operations on these two variables. And so I'm gonna do a sum, so that'll do the mean plus the standard error. I'm gonna go right click again, I'm gonna go to new formula column, combine, I'll do a difference, that's gonna be the mean minus the standard error. So now I have the upper and lower limits. So these columns I'm actually gonna use in my plot. So first I'll drag the mean to the Y, I'll drag the level to the X, I'll put on the bars. Now getting the custom error bars in there, 
Remember that we can drag these to the inside of the graph. That adds them to the graph. Now here's the trick. I'm actually going to expand the variable section on the left, which is actually jumps uh, mind or in jumps question, uh, what variables do you want to use for the graphic? I'm going to say, okay, don't use those two new columns for this first bar. Instead, I'm going to drag on a new bar. And then for that new bar, I'm going to say only use the custom errors. So I'm going to turn off the mean. And then remember I showed you a bar style that kind of looked like a standard error bar. That was actually the interval. And what the interval does, again, it shows the high to the low. Since I told it only use those two columns, the one where I calculated the high and the low, well, there we go. There's our custom error bar. And so I've actually added in multiple elements and delimited which variables they get to use in order to make that error. And so one thing I want to show you, and this actually goes to the, the next section here, graph customizations. So remember, always right-click things and jump. You can right-click the axis uh, to add reference lines, to change gradients, all that kind of thing. There's one special right click, right click the inside of the graph and go to customize. And this is actually where you can change the layers in the graph. And so these two bars, uh, the first bar was the background bar. The second bar was the, the air bar. The ordering here is the order in which they're drawn. So the last air bar is drawn over the original bar. What if I just wanted to show the top of the bar? Well, that just means moving the air bar up. And so what I now get is just the top of the bar because the other bar is hidden behind it. And so notice that you can customize lots of things and jump to get the specific elements you want. So we're getting very close to the end. Oh, yeah, Mia. Yeah, that's a that's a great place to get to right now. So I'll, I'll stop everything I'm doing now and let's talk about those quickly. Um, so certainly, you know, close the control panels before you save anything. Uh, but on the Mac, it's as simple as file, export. And what that'll do is show you the export options. If you're doing images, my recommendation is the TIFF or the Scalar Vector Graphic. And so those are nice ways to save it out. On the PC, you simply do File, Save As. Now another option I like is actually using the tools, the selection tool. And what this does is I can actually just copy out the elements that I want. I'll actually grab the whole thing here. And if I go to Edit, Copy, what this copies out is the vector graphic of this. And so if you go into, um, on the Mac, you can actually go to preview. Uh, what's nice about previews, you can just do file, new from clipboard. And what this will bring up is actually the, the clipboard image. And again, this is, uh, it's a vector, so it's, it's unlimited resolution. You can save this out as 1200 DPI, 2400 DPI, whatever you want. And so again, that trick was, uh, not really a trick, but just selecting it in jump and going to edit copy. And so that's my recommendation for, for saving them out. Now for making a grayscale, uh, certainly the, the complication here comes when you have uh, data where you're trying to show multiple categories. And so if I go back to an iris plot, uh, let me just make a new one here. And let's say I'm showing <clears throat> petal length by species. Um, and I want these bars to be different colors, so I color them. Now, the colors won't come out grayscale, of course, but you can right click and there's fill patterns if you like. Uh, certainly you can make the fill colors all grayscale, and so we can make one uh, slightly different grays than the other. Uh, that's not my favorite. Um, if you really want to show differences, the fill pattern is something that you, you might want to try. And so you can do different hashings. I'll right click on this one, do fill pattern and do something different. Um, and so use these uh, cautiously. If you have to do grayscale, of course, this is, this is something you're probably going to have to do. But um, I'll certainly be careful about what, what hashings you're using for that. And so that's the recommendation there. Now, if you're saving things out for the web, the recommendation I would have is saving things out as interactive HTML. Again, that's file, export on the Mac, or save as on the PC. And there's an interactive HTML option. Uh, one additional way in Jump, especially in Jump 13, which just came out a few uh, about a month ago, is this window option under Windows. There is the, or sorry, it's under View. Uh, it's Create Web Report, and what Web Report will do is actually go through uh, whatever open graphs you have. It'll allow you to uh, specify names for each of them. Uh, but the important thing it does is it'll build you uh, an HTML bundle. It's actually every graph you have and build you a little web interface for it. And so these are actually all still interactive. We can click on them and you can still work with the points. Sure, yeah, so there are times where a 3D does tell a story. Uh, under graph, scatterplot 3D is the one that I often point to. Um, and just like everything in Jump set up with the columns you want, um, you'll get the plot, the graphics are interactive. Um, one question we got last time would be, 
could you save this out as something for the web? And, and that's a very tricky thing to do. So no, but um, what I normally do, I'm just gonna embellish this a little bit with ellipses. Um, what I normally do is if I need to save this out uh, for a presentation, um, I'll set it spinning. So I hold down the shift key and just sort of drag it and that sets it spinning. I'll do it slower for you guys on the web. Um, but what you can do now is screen record like I am now. So you screen capture and uh, save out a video file or an animated GIF uh, from your screen capture software. So that'd be my recommendation. Yeah, so that's what I was gonna say. So if you, um, let's say you've made a number of graphs you really like, um, so you have this one, but you've also made another. And these are ones that maybe you're gonna make multiple times, and so uh, you wanna make them again or save all customizations. Um, every red triangle and jump has a save script section and there's multiple options. So save script to a data table and to a journal are the ones that I would recommend. Um, let me show you what these do. So I'll save to data table. It'll ask me in jump 13 what I want to name it. In previous versions, it just saves it out. Uh, and in your data table on the left-hand side, you'll see I have this section um, where I can actually just rerun these scripts. You can right-click and run in previous versions of jump or just click the play button and that brings them back. Uh, now if you save out to a journal, that'll actually save a script to a uh, journal like I have on the left-hand side of my screen. That's this journal, and so you can actually save them out that way. So if you make lots of different graphics, um, this is a great thing to do, especially because if the data changes, uh, you can simply rerun uh, the graphs that you had and uh, bring them back you know, rather quickly. And so highly recommended for that. Sure, yeah, so uh, the data filter is available under the red triangle. Um, it was under a script before, but now we promoted it. It's under local data filter. And uh, the local data filter is nice. You can actually, um, for different variables, uh, specify ranges you want to show, and the graph will update originally or update immediately. And so we can cycle through, you know, different petal widths here to see how the uh, the interior relationship changes. Now, this isn't the best graph for uh, if I go to, you know, let's say San Francisco crime. Um, and remember, I was showing police district by day of week here. And if I go to local data filter, what if I wanted to filter this by, by type of crime? So if I do category, um, and I wanted to show just arson, or just assault, or just drugs and narcotics, uh, the local data filter lets you very quickly go through these different categories, and um, or any variable in your data set, uh, to see how the visual really change uh, on the basis of the levels you've chosen. And if you want to animate that, there is an animation section. Uh, what animation does is just cycle through the different levels. So this is more appropriate. Um, I often find it's more useful when you have a, uh, a continuous variable uh, to cycle through. And so I was doing something in Graph Builder for that. Great, great question. Yeah, so if, let's say species here, and you didn't want Satosa, you didn't want them alphabetical. Um, you're not going to find that under the, the Graph Builder settings. The reason why is Graph Builder is inheriting the order uh, from the data set. And so in the data table, right-click a column, go to column properties, and go to value ordering. And value ordering will bring up a section here where this is actually within the column properties. Uh, you can just change the order. And so I'll put um, them in opposite order there. So click OK. And notice what Jump will do is immediately update the graphs. Now there is one ordering you can change. So if you double click an axis, there is the reverse order option. Um, but oftentimes you want to order a little more principally. So days of the week, for instance. So again, right click the column in the data set, go to column properties and go to value ordering. 